Hey everybody, I'm at the top of page 249 and Harry just had another lesson with Lupin about how to fight the um, Dementors and he ran, Harry ran into Professor McGonagall on the way back to the Gryffindor Tower and she gave him back his Firebolt uh, broomstick and she said that there were no curses on it so he's really excited and he and Ron are talking about it right now. She gave it to you? Excellent! Listen, can I still have a go on it tomorrow? Yeah, anything, said Harry his heart lighter than it had been in a month. You know what? We should make up with Hermione. She was only trying to help. Yeah, all right, said Ron. She's in the common room now, working for a change. They turned into the corridor to Gryffindor Tower and saw Neville Longbottom pleading with Sir Cadogan, who seemed to be refusing him entrance into Gryffindor Tower. I wrote them down, Neville was saying tearfully, but I must have dropped them somewhere. A likely tale, roared Sir Cadogan. Then, spotting Harry and Ron, Good even, my fine young yeoman. Come clap this loon in irons. He is trying to force entry to the chambers within. Oh, shut up, said Ron, as he and Harry drew level with Neville. I've lost the passwords, Neville told them miserably. I made him tell me what passwords he was going to use this week, because he keeps changing them, and now I don't know what I've done with them. Odds bodikins, said Harry to Sir Cadigan who looked extremely disappointed and reluctantly swung forward to let them into the common room. There was a sudden excited murmur as every head turned, and the next moment Harry was surrounded by people exclaiming over his firebolt. Where'd you get it, Harry? Will you let me have a go? Have you ridden it yet, Harry? Ravenclaw have no chance. They're all on clean sweep sevens. Can I just hold it, Harry? After ten minutes or so, during which the firebolt was passed around and admired from every angle, the crowd dispersed and Harry and Ron had a clear view of Hermione, the only person who hadn't rushed over to them, bent over her work and carefully avoiding their eyes. Harry and Ron approached her table and at last she looked up. I got it back, said Harry, grinning at her and holding up the firebolt. See, Hermione, there wasn't anything wrong with it, said Ron. Well, there might have been, said Hermione. I mean, at least you know now that it's safe. Yeah, I suppose so, said Harry. I'd better put it upstairs. I'll take it, said Ron eagerly. I've got to give Scabbers his rat tonic. He took the firebolt and, holding it as if it were made of glass, carried it away up the boy's staircase. Can I sit down then? Harry asked Hermione. I suppose so, said Hermione, moving a great stack of parchment off a chair. Harry looked around at the cluttered table, at the long arithmancy essay on which the ink was still glistening, at the even longer Mungle Studies essay, Explain why muggles need electricity. And at the rune translation Hermione was now poring over. How are you getting through all this stuff? Harry asked her. Oh, well, you know, working hard, said Hermione. Close up, Harry saw that she looked almost as tired as Lupin. Why don't you just drop a couple of subjects? Harry asked, watching her lifting books as she searched for her rune dictionary. I couldn't do that, said Hermione, looking scandalized. Arithmancy looks terrible, said Harry, picking up a very complicated-looking number chart. Oh, no, it's wonderful, said Hermione earnestly. It's my favorite subject. It's... But exactly what was wonderful about arithmancy, Harry never found out. At that precise moment, a strangled yell echoed down the boy's staircase. The whole common room fell silent, staring, petrified at the entrance. Then came hurried footsteps, growing louder and louder, and then Ron came leaping into view, dragging with him a bedsheet. Look, he bellowed, striding over to Hermione's table. Look, he yelled, shaking the sheets in her face. Ron, what? Scabbers, look, scabbers. Hermione was leaning away from Ron, looking utterly bewildered. Harry looked down at the sheet Ron was holding. There was something red on it, something that looked horribly like blood. Ron yelled into the stunned silence. He's gone. And you know what was on the floor? No, said Hermione in a trembling voice. Ron threw something down onto Hermione's rune translation. Hermione and Harry leaned forward. Lying on top of the weird spiky shapes were several long ginger cat hairs. That's the end of chapter 12. We're on chapter 13 now, and it's called Gryffindor vs. Ravenclaw. It looked like the end of Ron and Hermione's friendship. Each was so angry with the other that Harry couldn't see how they'd ever make up. Ron was enraged that Hermione had never taken Crookshank's attempts to eat Scabber seriously, hadn't bothered to keep a close enough watch on him, and was still trying to pretend that Crookshank's was innocent by suggesting that Ron look for Scabbers under all the boys' beds. 
Hermione, meanwhile, maintained fiercely that Ron had no proof that Crookshanks had eaten Scabbers, that the ginger hairs might have been there since Christmas, and that Ron had been prejudiced against her cat ever since Crookshanks had landed on Ron's head in the magical menagerie. Personally, Harry was sure that Crookshanks had eaten Scabbers, and when he tried to point out to Hermione that the evidence all pointed that way, she lost her temper with Harry, too. Okay, side with Ron. I knew you would, she said shrilly. First the firebolt, now Scabbers. Everything's my fault, isn't it? Just leave me alone, Harry. I've got a lot of work to do. Ron had taken the loss of his rat very hard indeed. Come on, Ron, you were always saying how boring Scabbers was, said Fred bracingly, and he's been off color for ages. He was wasting away. It was probably better for him to snuff it quickly. One swallow. He probably didn't feel a thing. Fred, said Ginny indignantly. All he did was eat and sleep, Ron. You said it yourself, said George. He bit Goyle for us once, Ron said miserably. Remember, Harry? Yeah, that's true, said Harry. His finest hour, said Fred, unable to keep a straight face. Let the scar on Goyle's finger stand as a lasting tribute to his memory. Oh, come on, Ron, get yourself down to Hogsmeade and buy a new rat. What's the point of moaning? In a last-ditch attempt to cheer Ron up, Harry persuaded him to come along to the Gryffindor team's final practice before the Ravenclaw match so that he could have a ride on the firebolt after they'd finished. This did seem to take Ron's mind off Scabbers for a moment. Great, can I try and shoot a few goals on it? So they set off for the Quidditch field together. Madam Hooch, who was still overseeing Gryffindor practices to keep an eye on Harry, was just as impressed with the firebolt as everyone else had been. She took it in her hands before takeoff and gave them the benefit of her professional opinion. Look at the balance on it. If the Nimbus series has a fault, it's a slight list to the tail end. You often find they develop a drag after a few years. They have updated the handle, too, a bit slimmer than the clean sweeps. Reminds me of the old silver arrows. A pity they've stopped making them. I learned to fly on one, and a very fine old broom it was, too. She continued in this vein for some time until Wood said, Uh, Madam Hooch, is it okay if Harry has the firebolt back? We need to practice. All oh, right, here you are then, Potter, said Madam Hooch. I'll sit over here with Weasley. She and Ron left the field to sit in the stadium, and the Gryffindor team gathered around Wood for his final instructions for tomorrow's match. Harry, I've just found out who Ravenclaw is playing as Seeker. It's Cho Chang. She's a fourth year, and she's pretty good. I really hope she wouldn't be fit. She's had some problems with injuries. Wood scowled his displeasure that Cho Chang had made a full recovery, then said, On the other hand, she rides a Comet 260, which is going to look like a joke next to the firebolt. He gave Harry's broom a look of fervent admiration, then said, Okay, everyone, let's go. And at long last, Harry mounted his firebolt and kicked off from the ground. It was better than he'd ever dreamed. The firebolt turned with the lightest touch. It seemed to obey his thoughts rather than his grip. It sped across the field at such speed that the stadium turned into a green and gray blur. Harry turned it so sharply that Alicia Spinett screamed. Then he went into a perfectly controlled dive, brushing the grassy field with his toes before rising 30, 40, 50 feet into the air again. Harry, I'm letting the snitch out, Wood called. Harry turned and raced a bludger toward the goalposts. He outstripped it easily, saw the snitch dart out from behind Wood, and within ten seconds had caught it tightly in his hand. The team cheered madly. Harry let the snitch go again, gave it a minute's head start, then tore after it, weaving in and out of the others. He spotted it lurking near Katie Bell's knee, looped her easily, and caught it again. It was the best practice ever. The team, inspired by the presence of the firebolt in their midst, performed their best moves faultlessly, and by the time they hit the ground again, Wood didn't have a single criticism to make, which, as George Weasley pointed out, was a first. I can't see what's going to stop us tomorrow, said Wood, not unless... Harry, you've sorted out your Dementor problem, haven't you? Yeah, said Harry, thinking of his feeble Patronus and wishing it were stronger. The Dementors won't turn up again, Oliver. Dumbledore will go ballistic, said Frog com Fred confidently. Well, let's hope not, said Wood. Anyway, good work, everyone. Let's get back to the tower. Turn in early. I'm staying out for a bit. Ron wants a go on the fireball, Harry told Wood, and while the rest of the team headed off to the locker rooms, Harry strode over to Ron, who vaulted the barrier to the stands and came to meet him. Madam Hooch had fallen asleep in her seat. Here you go, said Harry, handing Ron the fireball. Ron, an expression of ecstasy on his face, mounted the broom and zoomed off into the gathering darkness while Harry walked around the edge of the field watching him. 
Night had fallen before Madame Hooch awoke with a start, told Harry and Ron off for not waking her, and insisted that they go back to the castle. Harry shouldered the firebolt, and he and Ron walked out of the shadowy stadium, discussing the firebolt's superbly smooth action, its phenomenal acceleration, and its pinpoint turning. They were halfway toward the castle when Harry, glancing to his left, saw something that made his heart turn over. A pair of eyes gleaming out of the darkness. Harry stopped dead, his heart banging against his ribs. What's the matter? said Ron. Harry pointed. Ron pulled out his wand and muttered, Lumos! A beam of light fell across the grass, hit the bottom of a tree, and illuminated its branches. There, crouching among the budding leaves, was Crookshanks. Get out of here! Ron roared, and he stooped down and seized a stone lying on the grass, but before he could do anything else, Crookshanks had vanished with one swish of his long ginger tail. See? Ron said furiously, chucking the stone down again. She's still letting him wander about wherever he wants, probably washing down scabbers with a couple of birds by now. Harry didn't say anything. He took a deep breath as relief seeped through him. He had been sure for a moment that those eyes had belonged to the Grim. They set off for the castle once more. Slightly ashamed of his moment of panic, Harry didn't say anything to Ron, nor did he look left or right until they had reached the well-lit entrance hall. Harry went down to breakfast the next morning with the rest of the boys in his dormitory, all of whom seemed to think the firebolt deserved a sort of guard of honor. As Harry entered the great hall, heads turned in the direction of the firebolt, and there was a good deal of excited muttering. Harry saw with enormous satisfaction that the Slytherin team were all looking thunderstruck. Did you see his face? said Ron gleefully, looking back at Malfoy. He can't believe it. This is brilliant. Wood, too, was basking in the reflected glory of the firebolt. Put it here, Harry, he said, laying the broom in the middle of the table and carefully turning it so that its name faced upward. People from the Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff tables were soon coming over to look. Cedric Diggory came over to congratulate Harry on having acquired such a superb replacement for his nimbus, and Percy's Ravenclaw girlfriend, Penelope Clearwater, asked if she could actually hold the firebolt. "'Now, now, Penny, no sabotage,' said Percy heartily as she examined the firebolt closely. "'Penelope and I have got a bet on,' he told the team. Ten galleons on the outcome of the match.' Penelope put the firebolt down again, thanked Harry, and went back to her table." Harry, make sure you win, said Percy in an urgent whisper. I haven't got ten galleons. Yes, I'm coming, Penny. And he bustled off to join her in a piece of toast. Sure you can manage that broom, Potter, said a cold, drawling voice. Draco Malfoy had arrived for a closer look. Crab and Goyle right behind him. Yeah, reckon so, said Harry casually. Got plenty of special features, hasn't it? Said Malfoy, eyes glittering maliciously. Shame it doesn't come with a parachute in case you get too near a Dementor. Crab and Goyle sn sniggered. Pity you can't attach an extra arm to yours, Malfoy, said Harry. Then it could catch the snitch for you. The Gryffindor team laughed loudly. Malfoy's pale eyes narrowed, and he stalked away. They watched him rejoin the rest of the Slytherin team, who put their heads together, no doubt asking Malfoy whether Harry's broom really was a fireball. At a quarter to eleven, the Gryffindor team set off for the locker rooms. The weather couldn't have been more different from their match against Hufflepuff. It was a clear, cool day with a very light breeze. There would be no visibility problems this time, and Harry, though nervous, was starting to feel the excitement only a Quidditch match could bring. They could hear the rest of the school moving into the stadium beyond. Harry took off his black school robes, removed his wand from his pocket, and stuck it inside the t-shirt he was going to wear under his Quidditch robes. He only hoped he wouldn't need it. He wondered suddenly whether Professor Lupin was in the crowd watching. You know what we've got to do, said Wood, as they prepared to leave the locker rooms. If we lose this match, we're out of the running. Just just fly like you did in practice yesterday, and we'll be okay. They walked out onto the field to tumultuous applause. The Ravenclaw team, dressed in blue, were already standing in the middle of the field. Their seeker, Cho Chang, was the only girl in their team. She was shorter than Harry by about a head, and Harry couldn't help noticing, nervous as he was, that she was extremely pretty. She smiled at Harry as the teams faced each other behind their captains, and he felt a slight lurch in the region of his stomach that he didn't think had anything to do with nerves. Wood, Davy, shake hands, Madam Hooch said briskly, and Wood shook hands with the Ravenclaw captain. Mount your brooms, on my whistle. Three, two, one. Gotta stop there. <laughs>